So it looks like hey, Tubers, uh, uh, Daniel here. Today I want to show you a project that I've uh, been working on for the last few days that I'm uh, pretty excited about. Um, what this is is a cold sink, and um, what I hope to do is create a very, very low temperature on this end, uh, and I'll have to remove all that heat with this heat sink here. So uh, the main component in here is a uh, thermoelectric cooler, and I actually have three uh, thermoelectric coolers, one, two, and three, and they're stacked on top of each other here. And if you don't know what a th uh, thermoelectric cooler is, it is a uh, solid state device that transfers heat from one side to the other when you apply uh, power to it. And so what that means is one side gets very hot and the other side gets very cold. And if you stack them, you can increase the temp temperature differential from the very bottom to the top. Um, each one of these can produce, um, I think it's, I believe it's around 60 degrees of uh, difference in temperature from one side to the other. So that means that if you just use one, the, the, the sort of the theoretical max you could ever achieve is 60 degrees colder than the ambient temperature because you can remove all the heat on one side. Uh, and that's not enough. So what I'm ultimately, ultimately trying to do here is to create a cloud chamber. And a cloud chamber is a very primitive particle detector. Um, and what you need to do this uh, for the, this sort of like do-it-yourself home cloud chamber is you need a very strong cold sink because you need to create temperatures that are uh, around negative 26 degrees Fahrenheit is sort of like where it, the effect starts. And, uh, and then what you have is a, a chamber that uh, sits around this cold sink, a sealed chamber, and at the top you release isopropyl alcohol, or there's various other kinds of uh, solvents you can use. Isopropyl alcohol, as it kind of falls down towards the cold plate, it starts to sort of condense into this fog. And uh, the point of all this is that when uh, various types of particles pass through this fog, you can actually see the stream um, that's created. It's a very kind of early version of a bubble chamber, um, uh, which you know now is sort of the, the large hadron colliders uh, sensor arrays now, you know, replaced all of this. But the very earliest uh, particle detectors were cloud chambers, and um, once I once I saw one of these at the. Uh, San Francisco Exploratorium, and uh, I saw one of these cloud chambers, and it just blew my mind because you can sit there and just watch radiation, essentially radiation just sort of streaming through this layer of fog, and it's, it's really pretty to look at, and it's also just, you know, scientifically very interesting. The problem with these thermoelectric coolers, um, you might be wondering, like, why all this is here, why, why didn't I just, you know, connect them all up or whatever? Uh, but the problem, the basic problem here is that um, you have a stack of thermoelectric coolers here, and the top one is creating, is pulling heat away from the very top, and it's pushing it down, and that heat's being pushed, you know, it's cascading through each thermoelectric cooler. But the problem is the thermoelectric coolers themselves produce their own heat, uh, and they're really, they're, they're quite inefficient. I think their efficiency is around 20%, which means that for as much power you put into it, 80% of that like, becomes heat that also needs to be removed from the stack. And so you can't just connect them in series and put the same amount of power and expect for it to work because what happens is the first one starts to work okay, but then the second one is creating its own heat and now it has to sink all of the first one's heat. And that problem just gets exponentially worse as it goes down the stack, down the stack. and then at some point you have what's called a thermal runaway. And that means that it can no longer pull the amount of heat out of it that it's producing on its own. And so the temperature just climbs and climbs and climbs. Um, so the solution to this problem is not too complicated. It just means that you, can, you can't run the same amount of power at the top as you do at the bottom. Um, the one at the very top is a very low amount of, uh, fairly low amount of power. And the one at the bottom is a huge amount of power. And the idea is each step is able to sink all of the heat from itself and all of the steps above it. So I have kind of here a, a sort of like two-stage solution um, to this problem. Uh, the first is that the bottom thermoelectric cooler here, the one on the very bottom, 
obviously it's much larger, but it also is much more powerful. Like it has a higher amperage rating and it, in theory it can uh, extract more heat. It can move more heat. So I have two different types of uh, thermoelectric coolers. And, and the second part of the solution is that I am controlling uh, in a very uh, fine-tuned way the amount of power that's going to the second and third stages. So if you call the hot stage on the bottom number one, number two is the middle, number three is the coldest side. And the way I'm uh, controlling the amount of power going to each thermoelectric cooler is through uh, pulse width modulation over these uh, MOSFETs here, these in-channel MOSFETs. So I have an Arduino controller, and the Arduino controller is really just taking commands from my keyboard and my computer and uh, uh, assigning a, a pulse width modulation value to um, two different pins here. And those two different pins go to these two different MOSFETs, and I got these huge capacitors that I figured out that I needed to make it run efficiently, otherwise it just got really hot, sort of interesting. And then those go to uh, the second and third thermoelectric coolers. Um, so sort of ultimately, because I couldn't model this thing very well, you know, I just don't have the discipline to be able to do that, um, I figured the next best thing was to be able to control the amount of power going to each uh, Peltier cooler, and this, then just run a series of experiments where I tried to, you know, dial in the best temperature. And so ultimately the coldest value that I've been able to achieve is through trial and error. At the top of the stack here, there's this uh, styrofoam and it's held in, the whole thing is sort of like held down in pressure with this uh, zip tie here. And uh, my thinking here is just by putting this layer of styrofoam on the very top that was sort of just encapsulate the coal plate as well as I could. And, uh, and then what I have here is a, a, a you know, just a, a voltmeter here, a Fluke 179 that has a temperature probe. And that temperature probe is squished up against the cold plate, you know, the coldest part of the Peltier cooler on the inside here, and the styrofoam, so it's held into place. And um, this sensor, the sensor is only specified to go down to negative 40 degrees. So, like, you know, when we get towards the end of the experiment, you'll see that the measurements are pretty close to the limits of what the sensor can provide. So it's a little bit uh, dubious as to whether or not the values are really that accurate. Uh, right now we're at uh, 22 degrees Celsius, and I'll kind of switch back and forth because I know not everyone likes the different types of temperature. But it's essentially uh, room temperature in here, it's 72.8. Um, and what we're going to try to do here is to get this down to around uh, negative 30 Celsius, which surprisingly, if you don't know, is very close to negative 40 Fahrenheit because uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius are the exact same value at negative 40. So anyway, um, Without further ado, I just want to turn it on and start watching it cool down. Oh, and uh, so yeah, this, uh, this fan down here I have on a separate power supply, and it's supposed to be a 12 volt like um, CPU cooler, um, but I'm running it at 24 volts just to like kind of max out the amount of cooling. So that comes on first, it's going to be kind of loud. And then once that's on, I turn on the main power to the cool, uh, pelt healthier stack, but now I need to go in and assign the uh, PWM values because it starts out at zero, zero, zero. Okay, and so it begins. The, uh, so the bottom, the bottom thermoelectric cooler is just connected directly to 12 volts. I didn't say that before, but this one is not controlled by my apparatus here. So the one on the bottom here is just sort of maxed out. And then the second and third, they're, uh, they're smaller Peltier coolers, so they automatically m move less heat for the uh, same amount of power, or same amount of voltage. And so the values that I have, the, the pulse width modulation values that I have for the second and third stage are uh, 100 out of 256, so that's like a, between a quarter and a third. And this one is 10, so it's actually one, one, tenth, one tenth of the power of this one. And uh, unfortunately those values are a bit arbitrary. Um, I found that you know, different levels of capacitors resulted in better efficiency, and even different resistor values um, on the input of the MOSFET would, would create a different power level. So those numbers are a little bit arbitrary, but it is worth noting that the, you know, at least in the raw numbers, that the top one is uh, essentially one-tenth of the second stage. 
And I suspect that the second and third stage is also about one tenth. So that means that you have a, you know, a factor of 10 in reduction of inefficiency for every stage and that's why you have, uh, why that's the limit of this, this sort of technology. If you want to create really cold temperatures, you know, if I wanted to create another stage, I, you'd, I'm talking about having a much bigger Peltier cooler and then another and another, like you can see how it could get, the, it's just physically very large. Um, but it's cool and I'm glad I got it to work this well so far and it looks like right now we're com coming up on negative 25, uh, negative 26 Celsius, negative 15 Fahrenheit. You know, those are colder temperatures than most people have experienced. Okay, I'll let it run for a few minutes and just see what the coldest temperature we can get and then that'll be it. It looks like uh, we've gotten down to negative 30 degrees Celsius or so, stabilized around negative 30. Um, and that's negative 21.9 in Fahrenheit. Obviously those values are very close because it's near negative 40. And um, I think my record temperature is, I think the record I got down to is negative 33 Celsius. And unfortunately I lost part of my data file. I was collecting data, trying different values and stuff, and I, and I lost the end of that file. So. Um, but this is already sort of in, in the right ballpark for, um, for the cloud chamber. I'll go ahead and sh shut all this stuff off. You can watch the temperature come up. Oh, and by the way, that heat sink is only about 90 to 100 degrees, I've noticed, which is pretty good. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the temperature will start coming up here. Put it on Fahrenheit for the Americans. Okay, so that was negative 30 degrees Celsius and I'm happy with that number because um, uh, I can definitely improve the efficiency of the design of the stack um, by adding s sort of like insulation around this thing. And I'm exploring like different types of expanding foam or silicon or various other things just to create a sort of um, insulation around all of this stuff, so it's not sharing heat so easily. Um, and in fact, there'll be a standoff, like a, a large aluminum block basically, that'll put some distance in between this, the hottest part of the device, and the, where we want the coldest part of the device to be. So the layer of insulation that'll be uh, available is, you know, I, I want it to be like inch and a half or something like that. Um, and other than that, uh, I plan to experiment with, experiment, experiment with different values on this uh, number one uh, thermoelectric cooler and I want to try larger capacitors to see if, if that's a little bit better. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the sort of discipline to model all this stuff and uh, do it so, you know, studiously, but um, I've gotten pretty good results and um, yeah. So there it is. There's my thermoelectric cooler, negative uh, 30 degrees Celsius, which is probably colder than any temperature I, temperature I've encountered in the natural world and probably much colder than most things I've ever seen uh, except for I've seen dry ice and liquid nitrogen up close. So, um, but that's the best I can do in my home at the moment. And uh, sort of like the, the third level of uh, cooling will be to actually cool this uh, heat sink with a liquid uh, water obviously is the first choice and you'll see other people that have used uh, water cooling with thermoelectric coolers just because the sort of like volume of heat that they produce. Um, but I was thinking I might even take it one step further and make a isopropyl uh, coolant that's cooled by dry ice. So isopropyl can get to a colder temperature without freezing obviously than water, um, but it does get more viscous. Uh, and the idea is if I have this super cold liquid flowing through here, <laughs> I might actually be able to make this whole stack, you know, drop by like 50 degrees or something like that. Um, but anyway, that's just a guess. Again, I don't have the discipline to really know how to model this stuff, um, but uh, I'm seeing good results and I'm going to keep playing with it. All right, tubers. I hope you enjoyed uh, watching my apparatus work and the explanation. Uh, if you have any questions, just let me know in the, in the comments and I'll try to respond. 
Um, I got about 100 degrees uh, temperature differential, 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature differential um, for sort of my first pass at this, so I'm pretty happy with the results. And uh, I hope to update uh, to sort of this project once it gets more along the way, uh, the Cloud Chamber project. And uh, so you, there will be some more videos coming soon, hopefully. All right, thanks for watching. Later.